Well, when we put together Sports Medicine Conference, and actually we've been doing this since 2011, so it's been a number of years we, we've had this Sports Medicine Conference, and we try to have different themes and have different approach. And for this year's conference, we were very fortunate to have Dr. Poco all the way from Colorado. Uh, he has developed a very unique patent pending physical therapy system that he calls 180. Uh, he has been involved with multiple professional organizations, including everything from the New York R City Rockettes to the uh, Los Angeles Chargers. Uh, he has uh, worked on a couple of local athletes uh, uh, who are playing for the Chargers. We have a couple of guys who, uh, who went to high school here locally, and uh, that's kind of how we found his name. He himself played college football at uh, University of Northern Colorado, got his physical therapy degree from Slippery Rock University, and as he went into therapy um, and being a sports uh, athlete himself, he saw a disconnect, and uh, with that disconnect, uh, he has developed an, a, a new system to try and integrate physical therapy, sports-specific performance, and try to get the athletes back on the field. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing his talk. Uh, all the way from Colorado, Dr. Rhett Polka. Test, test, oh, all right. Okay, so, good morning. I'd like to start today by uh, telling you a true story of a conversation that I overheard in my physical therapy clinic. Uh, okay, so a true story, conversation that I overheard with a physical therapist and a um, patient that was coming in for an initial evaluation. So before we go too far on our story, how many of you have heard of plantar fasciitis? Okay. How many of you have had plantar fasciitis? Okay. How many of you currently have plantar fasciitis? All right. Sounds good. Okay. So this patient came in. She was uh, 60, 65 years old, active adult. Uh, she liked uh, hiking. She took her dog for a walk every day about two miles. Um, avid gardener and yard uh, work type stuff. And she was coming in because she couldn't do those activities anymore because her foot was killing her. So she uh, came in, sat down, started telling the therapist about uh, her situation. And he said, okay, so um, I understand that you have pain in the morning when you get out of bed. Your foot feels tight after you sit down for a long time. It's hard to get up and start walking. Uh, tell me whatever else uh, information you have. And she said, okay, well, uh, I actually had this problem start about a year ago, and I went to physical therapy, got great results, was happy with my treatment, and moved on with life. Went back to doing everything that I love to do. Uh, then about six months later, my symptoms came back. So I went back to physical therapy, got the same treatment, got the same results, was happy, started hiking, walking, gardening, all that kind of stuff. So she explained that she was with this therapist today because her symptoms had once again come back. She was new to town, so she was looking for a new therapist, mentioned to a friend that uh, she was having this problem, and the friend said, okay, I got a guy that you can go see. So that's how she came in to meet this therapist. So he said, okay, sounds good. Can you tell me what the uh, treatment was that your previous physical therapist was working on with you? So she said, sure. So one of the things that uh, we worked on both in the clinic and he gave me to do at home was rolling my foot. So I'd either roll on a foam roller, I'd roll on a tennis ball, I put a bottle of water in the freezer, I'd roll on that. She said that uh, the rolling was to break up adhesions in the plantar fascia and to uh, loosen the fascia up. Then she said that the other thing they focused on a lot was stretching. So they did a lot of calf stretching, hanging off of a stair, pushing on a wall, that kind of stuff. And that was um, meant to loosen the muscle up in the calf and take the pressure off of her foot. The other thing that they did was 
use orthotics or shoe inserts. So um, she explained that uh, the therapist told her that uh, her foot was having problems accepting load, and uh, that's why there was too much pressure put on that. If they put the uh, orthotic in the shoe, that helps the foot take the load off and support the foot. And she said that uh, as long as she has her orthotics in, she is relatively pain-free up until this last flare-up. So as the therapist continued to listen to her talk, um, get information, he then said, okay, I want you to stand up and take off your shoes. I want to do a little bit of a screen and see what you look like moving around. So he had her take off her shoes, had her walk, uh, squat, single leg squat, double leg squat, walk on her heels, walk on her toes. Obviously the heel walk didn't feel very good, uh, but he wanted to see her do it anyway. So he kind of went through this screen, uh, looking at the lower extremities and the foot. Then for some reason he branched off into an upper body screen and looked at her shoulder motion, her cervical spine motion, trunk motion, all of that, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, after that, he put her on the table and started doing some manual techniques and a little bit more further exam. And as he was doing that, he explained to her that he was gonna change gears a little bit. So what he wanted her to do was stop doing all the rolling. So he said, you know, I don't want you to roll on a foam roller. I don't want you to roll on a tennis ball. I don't want you to roll on a bottle of ice. Just stop doing the rolling stuff. I think that might be part of your problem. Then he said, I also want you to stop doing all the stretching. So no more stretching off of a stair, no more pushing against the wall. I don't want you to stretch your calf. I don't want you to stretch your quads. I don't want you to stretch your hamstrings. I don't want you to stretch anything. Then he went further and said, I also want to get you out of those orthotics. Not only did he want to get her out of her orthotics, but he also said that he wanted her to walk barefoot when she was at home and in the yard in the grass. And she wa he wanted her to hike and walk on her long walks without any art support. And also wanted her to switch from the art support to a really loose shoe that didn't have any support at all. So, a little bit different take sounds like this guy had. And as I'm watching this interaction between the patient and the therapist, I see the same look that I kind of see on some of your faces right now. And that look is, what do you mean? So yes, I fit Justin Bieber into a sports medicine talk conference. And so now every time you have plantar fasciitis or you have a patient with plantar fasciitis, you can think of Justin Bieber and the 180 system. So, what did this therapist see that the other, pair, that the other therapist um, didn't see? As, you're, as I'm going through this and you're thinking about this, what are your uh, feelings now as far as uh, what's going on with this information? And I know we, didn't, we were gonna do a test, but we didn't do this test, so we'll, we'll see if this works. Okay, so on your phones, you should be able to send an answer up here. So do you think that uh, this new therapist was giving information that's too confusing? Why would you give this patient something uh, that's totally opposite of what she had before and you already know that what she had before she was happy with? Or do you think this makes perfect sense? Why not do something completely different? Or are you not sure? Do you want more information? Okay, so we've got some risk takers. Ready to just jump off the cliff and say, let's do something different. And we've got a good portion of you that want more information or you're not sure uh, what to think so far. It looks like we're numbers are pretty much in. Okay, for those of you that aren't sure and want more information, let's look at how we make decisions. So, more information. We base our decisions on past experience, what we've been told, what we've been exposed to, and what we've been uh, experiencing. The question is, is that enough information? Uh, what information do we have? How do we know the information that we do have is accurate? What do we need to know that we don't know yet? And more importantly, where should we get that information from? So, 
Since we've touched on how we develop opinions and base decisions, let's see if we can get more information. So it looks like most of you would like to have more information to make an uh, informed decision. So go ahead and answer this question. Either you're fine with the information that you have, or yes, please, I would like to learn more about what this guy is thinking. Boom, there it is. Okay, very good. Okay, so we're gonna watch a quick video here. And I, I know I, I got a really good looking young model here. And uh, we're gonna listen to this guy talk about foam rolling and see if he can give us some insight as to what this therapist was thinking about his, his, uh, his um, request of the patient stopping the rolling. Now that we've seen what foam rolling can do to neuromuscular facilitation or force output of a muscle. Actually, that was this. Okay, here we go on the All right, roll. so what we're gonna do today is look at the physiological effects of foam rolling and stretching. So first what we're gonna do is basically a repeat of a pilot study that we did uh, about a year or two ago on foam rolling. So what we're gonna do is check strength of glute medius, push, very good. And we'll see that he's got 43 foot pounds of force. As we're kind of reviewing this, he's going to just foam roll 10 times the IT band. So we're testing facilitation of the gluteus medius after rolling the IT band. So we're going to see what happens to that muscle output after just 10 back and forth on the foam roller. So here we go again, and push, and good. And we see that he went down to 27.4 foot-pounds. All right, let me do some quick calculations for you there so you don't have to do the math in your head. That's a 36% decrease in force output of the gluteus medius after foam rolling the IT band 10 times, okay? So the little, uh, gadget that I have there is a um, handheld dynamometer measuring foot pounds of force. So what we see is that the rolling of the IT band, which is similar tissue wise to the plantar fascia, decreased force output of the muscles that are attached and associated with the IT band. So now maybe we can see where this therapist was coming up with this thought process of not doing the foam rolling on the plantar fascia. But of course, we don't understand why he wouldn't want her to stretch because we all know that stretching uh, is something that we've been doing for eons. Um, I'm sure that some of you this morning when you got out of bed stretched, <clears throat> before you work out, you stretch. When you feel you tight, you feel tight, you stretch. So let's see if there's some kind of information uh, that we're missing on the effects of stretching. Now that we've seen what foam rolling can do to neuromuscular facilitation or force output of a muscle, let's take a look at what just a conventional stretch will do. So what we're going to do is test output of rectus femoris, push, good, and we're going to see that it's about 35.9 before we do anything. We're going to roll over, we're just going to do a quick 10 second stretch of the quads, tell me when. So easy 10 second stretch, typically what your normal person would do before they run or work out or whatever. Roll back on your back. And let's see what happens now. And push. And relax. And we go down to 28.1. Okay, so quick calculation there for you. That's a decrease of 22% in force output of the rectus femoris after a 10 second stretch. So the question is, what happened here? Do we understand why our force output decreased after doing such, something so accepted and mundane as stretching? Um, is there information that we weren't given on the physiological effects of stretching or were we given information a long time ago that we forgot to apply to our clinical world and therefore we ended up forgetting what we learned a long time ago. So 
Now that we've looked at the uh, effects of the rolling and the stretching, does that start to make us think and change our opinion on whether we should go ahead and do what the new therapist is saying or stick with the old therapist? Or does this make you even more confused? Okay, looks like we're getting close. And is everybody's technology working? Does it feel, does, is anybody having problems getting their votes in? It's all good? What's that? Okay, so we'll go with those numbers are there. <clears throat> okay, so now that we've got some new information and we've got some people that are changing their minds and we've got some people that are still a little bit confused and want more information, the big thing is how did the patient do after they received the um, patient education from the therapist and how did they do after they left coming back with their follow-up visit? So if we check in with the patient on her follow-up visit, it was about three days later. She had discontinued the orthotics. Um, she was walking barefoot in the house and in the yard, uh, pain-free. She was uh, doing all of her hikes and her walks in the morning, pain-free without the inserts. She had actually dug up some old gardening shoes or something that she found that were very um, minimalistic and no support and was pain-free with those. Um, I can also tell you that she was in uh, therapy for a total of four weeks. She was in three times over the course of four weeks, and she was completely symptom-free. Um, she also uh, mentioned to the therapist as they continued to work that she had some low back and shoulder issues that he also worked on with those. She was symptom-free with those using the same thought process. And uh, by the time she discharged four weeks later, she had already referred three of her friends to this new therapist. Um, so, how did I know all this information? Uh, because she was a patient at 180, and she was uh, seeing one of my staff PTs, and that's the conversation that I was eavesdropping on, was between one of my staff PTs and this patient. So, now that we know that the patient did really well and changed everything that she was doing before, would better information, along with understanding how to apply that information, be beneficial to us as clinicians? So what we see here is that the thought process that the therapist used was based on scientific um, understandings that we all learned when we went to PT school, med school, whatever the case may be. The problem is sometimes we don't learn how to apply those to clinical situations, and that's where the ball gets dropped and we start heading down the road of symptom modification versus science-based treatment. So, looks like the overwhelming majority of you would like to have a better understanding of not only the knowledge, but how to apply that knowledge. So, uh, as Dr. Eaton said, my name is Dr. Rhett Polka. I am the founder of the 180 system and the president of 180 Physical Therapy. I'm here today to talk to you about innovation in the world of sports medicine, tell you my story, and give you hopefully a kickstart in changing the future of your profession. At the conclusion of this keynote, my purpose is that you understand what innovation is, how it applies to us, and why it is so vital in the field of medicine and sports medicine. So we're going to cover what the 180 system is, where it came from, how it is different, why it is so effective, and how you can learn how to get the same great results with your patients. But before we start down that road, let's first ask what if. What if we used critical thinking and root cause analysis to base decisions on before we ever put our hands on a patient? 
What if we had a reproducible and structured thought process and treatment strategy based on accepted scientific principles? What if we slowed down and had a plan? Used science as a guide, looked at patients as unique individuals, made function our focus, and took away all of the gimmicks that are floating around out there? What if we got immediate results that lasted, and what if we were seen as experts? The reason why I'm here today is because somebody from Bear Care thought I was innovative and wanted me to come speak with you and share my story. The other reason is because I believe we need more innovation and innovators, and I think that everybody in here can be one. <clears throat> um, just about anybody can be an innovator because all it takes is a vision, a purpose, and a will to change what you are doing. My goals for you today are for you to be able to take apart your thinking, learn how to be inspired to think critically, start questioning everything you see both clinically and outside the clinic, find like-minded people that you can grow with, expect more from your and our profession, reignite the flame that got you in this profession in the first place, and to be the future. My question to you is, wouldn't you rather fail daring to be great at something that you are passionate about than just be successful at something that has minimal impact? Okay, we already have too many average professionals out there that ex accept the status quo and eventually fade into the background of the mundane. So my question to you is why not be great? In the next slide, we're going to run through some traits that according to Forbes magazine are what the traits are that make uh, innovators so innovative and change uh, their surroundings. As we get towards the end of this list on the, on the next slide, I want you to Type into your phone the name of somebody who pops into your mind as an innovator um, and make it kind of contemporary, like real world today uh, people. I know Michelangelo is very innovative, but um, he's not what we're talking about right now. So here's the list of innovative traits or traits that innovators have according to Forbes magazine. So innovators see and do things differently. Um, they are authentic leaders that are committed to value and best practices. They go after complex solutions without taking shortcuts. They realize that innovation is a, not a one-time thing. So once they have one innov innovation, they go for another and go for another. They're not afraid to move past conventional wisdom. They're rule breakers that live outside the box. And they're really not trying to change the world all in one day. What they're basically doing is seeing that there's a better way to do something, and they start changing things little by little, and at the end of the day, they've made big changes. So go ahead and send in, uh, type in on your phone, names of people that pop into your head when you see these traits. That's pretty cool, huh? So I'm inferring that the more votes or the more mentions somebody gets, the bigger their name gets. So Elon Musk keeps getting bigger and bigger. Okay, so Lady Gaga, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, um, Goggins, Tony Robbins, Gandhi, Jeff Bezos, lots of great names up there. Okay. Okay, so let's now go down the road and, and tell you about my journey to, from where I started to where we are now. Um, so as Dr. Eaton told you, I was a former athlete 
uh, in junior high, I was playing multiple sports, and uh, through that, I started to work on lifting. So sports performance, getting bigger, faster, stronger, was all into the lifting thing. Um, started in about seventh grade, and then when I got to ninth grade, uh, I got hurt. Nothing major, but it was my first sports injury that sent me to physical therapy for the first time. So at physical therapy, I looked around and saw a lot of really cool things that kind of meshed with the background of strength and conditioning, and that's what kind of lit the fire to get me going down this road. Um, so that was 1988, and this is the PT clinic that I went to. So in the 80s, we can see that uh, it's pretty modality driven. We can see on the right hand side there, there's um, ultrasound units, uh, electrical stimulation. We had a traction room with a hydroculator. We had uh, tape and braces and orthotics and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we had exercise machines that you see there in the middle of the bottom picture. Um, your typical 1980s single plane, single joint uh, exercise machines. Uh, we used a lot of uh, one size fits all protocols. Patient comes in with patellofemoral pain, you give them these five stretches and these five exercises and send them out the door. A um, lot of handoff between physical therapist and aid. Uh, physical therapist does the eval, hand them over to the aid to do the exercise and the stretching and the massage and all that kind of stuff, and very physician driven. So, walking into this clinic, I thought it was totally awesome. Um, this is what I wanted to do. So, I continued down that road. So I went through high school, continued to play sports, had little, little injuries, nothing ever major, uh, but still kept me um, coming in and out of the training room. I got my undergraduate degree in kinesiology with an emphasis in exercise science from the University of Northern Colorado, where I played football, got more injuries, went to the training room more often, still stayed in touch with sports medicine, and then went to Phys or, uh, Slippery Rock University to get my doctorate in physical therapy. So from the time I got hurt in 1988 until the time I graduated in 2000, uh, I, I was gaining all of this excitement. Can't wait to get out. Can't wait to do sports medicine. Can't wait to work with people. So when I got out, I was totally excited, geeked up, all jazzed, ready to get out and see patients. And wouldn't you know, I got a job at the clinic that I was a patient at. And guess what had changed from 1988 until 2000? Not much, same clinic. So we still have the ultrasound, the electrical, electrical stimulation, same weight machines. They were doing the same protocols, um, same traction room, hydroculator, cold packs, all that stuff. So I was totally bummed out. So I was wondering what happened? Where was the innovation that should have taken place from 1988 until 2000? So the majority of my first year after PT school, I was here. So I'm inferring that there's gotta be more than just me in this room that got out of PT school and was like, what the heck is going on here? So give me a quick raise of the hands if after the first year of PT school, you were like, is this what I, what I went to school for seven years for? All right, thank you. Okay. so. The reason why I was frustrated wasn't because I wasn't getting results. So my patients felt better. They went home with better range of motion. They had less muscle tightness. They had less pain. They had less swelling. So I wasn't, it wasn't that I wasn't getting results. The problem was when I would run into those patients in the grocery store six months after I discharged them for low back pain and asked them, hey, how you doing? And they'd say something like, well, you know, my back pain came back about a week or two after I got done seeing you. I kept doing the stretches that you gave me, it really didn't help, now I'm getting an injection. Or now I'm seeing a chiropractor. Or now I'm getting surgery. So the repetition of that scenario happening over and over made me think maybe what I'm doing isn't fixing the problem. Maybe I'm helping them feel better and I'm giving them relief for the short term, but am I actually changing things for the long term? And that's when I began to say, there's got to be a better way. So um, this made me think that um, if I 
maybe I missed something in school, maybe, maybe I wasn't doing something correctly. Now, when I went back to work, when I went to work in the clinic that I was a former patient at, all of those therapists were, were therapists in 1988. So I got into a clinic that was uh, people with 20 years experience. So I started thinking, well, maybe something changed and they missed it, and now I'm missing it. So I asked myself, what was the purpose of going to PT school and undergrad for seven years? Was it to accept average expectations and results, or was it so I could push for extraordinary results? Was it so I could memorize facts and just kind of forget those, or was it that I was supposed to get out and apply the knowledge that I had learned in school? Was I going to fall in line, or was I going to bend the line? So my intellectual vision quest started there. This is when I went back and I started reviewing all of my notes from PT school, undergrad, started reading books, went to every continuing educa education class that I could find, and um, started to try to figure out how to apply that knowledge. So if we look at these terms, many of these should seem really familiar. So these are all things that we learned throughout our education. If some of this stuff looks familiar to you, then you should have been able to apply this to the videos that we saw on the foam rolling and the stretching. Because as I said, the therapist in that, in that scenario with the plantar fascia patient didn't do anything that was groundbreaking. He didn't do anything that, was, um, that you couldn't do yourself. What he did was use this information and applied it to a patient. So he understood what the muscle spindle does. He under, understood what inhibition is, what the neuromuscular junction is, how gamma motor neurons work, and what the central nervous system feedback loop is. That's all the stuff that he applied in that scenario. The other thing that he remembered is the law of reciprocal inhibition. So the exercises that he gave that patient for home all dealt with uh, the law of reciprocal inhibition and re restarting or reversing inhibition rather than causing inhibition. So at the end of the day, what I figured out it was that it didn't matter, it doesn't matter how smart you are, it matters how you are smart. By this time, I figured out that I finally had something that worked, and by, mean, by work, I don't mean patients felt better, I mean they can squat, they can run, they can jump without any kind of uh, symptom modification. The other thing that I figured out was that I was using what's called critical thinking. So this is Richard Paul's Wheel of Reasoning, which is the basis of critical thinking, that goes through um, several steps. So what we have, and, and as I talk about critical thinking and some of the, the things that we forget to apply, I'm not just talking about sports medicine, I'm not just talking about physical therapy, I'm not just talking about medicine in general. This happens across the board in every profession that there is. Education, um, government officials, uh, salesmen, Everybody needs to use critical thinking in their uh, daily processes, in their profession. And the problem is we tend to pick and choose parts of the wheel to use because we've become a very now society. We want, we want results right now. We want answers right now. Everything's at our fingertips. And that causes us to miss some of the steps in the, in the wheel of critical thinking. So what I figured out was the, the process or the system that I was working uh, had a purpose, it was based on a point of view, and it understood that implications and consequences were the result of uh, those thought processes. Also understood that experience may not give us the best information. So what we've been told may not be the correct information. Maybe we have better information if we actually went back and reviewed the facts and the, and the, de and the uh, data. Um, at the end of the day, the purpose of critical thinking is to understand the logic of your discipline. When I got out of PT school, I knew what I did. I knew how to do what I was doing, but I didn't know or understand why I was doing what I was doing. By taking apart my thinking and asking more questions, I had finally figured out why I was doing what I was doing, why it worked, why it was the opposite of what I had done in the past, and why I had to move out on my own. So, with zero business experience, no clue how to do billing, marketing, insurance, and all that kind of stuff that goes into a successful PT clinic, I opened 180 Physical Therapy. That was 
approximately 15 years ago, and since then, 180 has grown into a two-clinic model with multiple PTs, um, and the good thing is, I didn't know anything about marketing, and luckily, I don't need to market, because our patients, like the, patient, the plantar fascia patient, they go out and spread the word for us. So when you give patients results, and that changes the way they think and the way they live, they go out and they are your spokesmodels. So um, since we looked at what the old school conventional clinic looked like that I worked at, let's take a look at what a 180 clinic looks like. So what you'll notice here is that there are no modalities. So no ultrasound, no electrical stimulation, no traction, no hot packs, no cold packs. Uh, also, there's no tape, no braces, no needles, no cups. So, the other thing that we see here that we'll touch on here in a second are these two windows. Uh, we don't have any exercise equipment in our um, office area. Uh, we do have a performance, uh, sports performance gym that we share uh, space with, and we have all of our equipment in there, which I'll show you in a second. So, as you can see, our treatment area is basically a table. So. What we figured out is that with a thought process based on science and manual therapy skills, we can use a treatment table and get patients better faster and have them stay better longer. Now, this individual that you see here is Dr. Collar. He's one of our staff PTs and he is um, the therapist that I was talking about in the plantar fascia scenario. What he's doing here is a functional screen, which we start and end all of our visits with because once again, we care about function not just controlling symptoms. So this patient that he's screening right here is a tib-fib fracture with an ORIF. Um, so what you saw him doing was screening her uh, thoracic and lumbar spine. I think before he did that, he had already run through the upper body screen with cervical spine and shoulders, and he's working his way down to the squat portion. Here we see Dr. Patel, one of our other staff therapists doing our manual therapy portion of our treatment. So as you can see, it's hands-on. We have eye contact with our patients. We can, patient, we can do patient education throughout the entire uh, span of the visit. We spend anywhere, depending on how much we need to do with our patients, we spend anywhere from 15 to 35 minutes with them on the table doing manual therapy. The other time we spend screening, educating, and doing exercise. And at the end of the day, we encourage our patients to think different so they can live well. Okay, so here's a couple pictures of our gym. So not only do we take our athletes back in the gym, we take our Medicare patients back in the gym. So before I came down here, uh, Dr. Patel that day had, a, had to have been 70 year old lady back in the gym doing heavy carries with uh, um, kettlebells and I think he did some deadlift with her. Now, she wasn't doing a 300 pound deadlift, she was doing like the bar. Um, but that's pretty good for what she was coming in for. So now I know you're, you're wondering, what is the manual therapy? What is so different about what you're doing? Uh, in the previous videos, I showed you how we can cause neuromuscular inhibition with stretching and foam rolling. Now the question should be, if we can cause inhibition, can we reverse inhibition, which would make our patients get better? So here's a quick demo of me working on somebody. Uh, so I'm going to use the dynamometer again for, for um, objective measures just to show you what, we're not using the dynamometer on a daily basis with patients, this is just for video type stuff. Um, but I'm going to assess and then treat an inhibited vastus lateralis. Here's how complicated it is. So we'll start with vastus lateralis. Good. And as Dr. Patel is showing you the reading, I'm just going to refacilitate normal neuromuscular facilitation and we'll retest. Good. And then we're going to go to. Okay, so that last reading was hard to see, but that was an increase in 142. It was a 142% increase in less than 10 seconds after stimulating the vastus lateralis. So that's how we would reverse uh, the inhibition that's either caused from them stretching or fatigue or exercise or patients that are coming in with pain. So pain is always the end result of neuromuscular inhibition. So there's a lot of things that happen in between those two steps, but 
our thought process is if we stop the inhibition, which is the root cause of pain and injury, then we can stop the pain and injury without chasing symptoms all day. So, function versus flash. So on our left, we have Rick Barry, who is one of the greatest free throw shooters in NBA history with the underhand free throw shot. Really sexy, okay? You wanna know why people don't shoot free throws underhand? It's not because it's not a high percentage, it's because you don't sell very many jerseys shooting underhand free throws, okay? So Shaq, on the other hand, uh, I think Rick Barry's uh, free throw percentage was 89%. Shaq, on the other hand, was less than 53%, but he sold a lot of jerseys and it looked really cool while he was missing his free throws. So what we have established is that rather than going for flash and looking, looking like we're doing something you know, groundbreaking on Instagram, we would rather go for results. So rather than chasing symptoms and trying to make people feel better for the short term, we figured out that if we treat them on a neurophysiological level, they get better now and they stay better tomorrow and next week and the month after. So, what is the 180 system? It's a reproducible evaluation strategy and treatment tool built on the belief that normal human function has a direct correlation with human physiology. In order to have optimal function, the neuromuscular base must be sensitive. When this occurs, risk of injury is decreased, recovery from injury is rapid, and performance is maximized. So we have a, a portion of our patients that don't even have injuries. They're athletes that don't wanna have injuries or they wanna run faster, jump higher, lift more weights. So what they figured out is if we can maximize the neuromuscular function of their muscles, they can not only avoid injury or decrease the risk of injury, they can also run faster, jump higher, and lift more weight. Who does it work with? So the great news is it works with all patients because it attacks the neurological root cause of symptoms and dysfunction. It's built on accepted laws of physiology, anatomy, physics, and biomechanics. So that slide with all of the terminology on it is what fed into uh, building this system. And we use it with Medicare patients, work comp patients, auto injury patients, athletes, weekend warriors, people that, don't, that sit at computers all day, old people, young people. Uh, we, I think the youngest person I've ever seen was probably like six or seven years old and the oldest person was close to 100. Works with everybody because your physiology is the same. Why do we do what we do? So we believe that, uh, we believe in challenging conventional thinking by thinking differently. We do that by using proven strategies that are the opposite of everything you've tried. We succeed by re-educating your body to function efficiently and effectively. Would you like to join our team of professionals? So, the reason why it's called 180, our patients think it's called 180 because they feel completely better when they leave, so they felt bad when they came in and they feel fantastic when they leave, so they think it's because of that. The reason why I came up with 180 is because it's the opposite of everything that I was doing when I got out of PT school and I, and I was in that first conventional PT clinic. Who uses 180? So as Dr. Eaton uh, alluded to, uh, we have quite a few professional athletes um, I've done work with uh, elite um, Division I uh, ath athletic programs. Uh, if you're in a CrossFit, I've worked with Rich Fronig, who I think just won his seventh uh, CrossFit, CrossFit Games or CrossFit Open. Um, so I, I see a lot of CrossFitters. So CrossFit is, is really good for business. Um, <laughs> so if you, if you want to have a spike in um, patient uh, numbers, team up with a CrossFit. On the flip side, the, the thing that I figured out with the CrossFitters was they were doing a lot of things wrong. So once I got them to stop doing the things wrong, I just shot myself in the foot because they weren't getting hurt anymore. So don't tell them how to fix everything when you go there the first time because then you won't have any patience from that, that, uh, that box. Um, so we work with everybody, including these people. Um, uh, we work with physical therapists. We have physical therapists in all of these areas. Uh, we've been teaching courses. We had a big course in Arkansas uh, earlier this year where we had um, one PT clinic that was gonna host the course. Once they kind of saw what we were gonna do and the results that we were getting, they said, hey, 
we don't want to host the course, we want to have the entire course. So we don't want our competitors to know the 180 system. We want to be the only ones in the area. I said, fantastic. So they sold out the course. They brought in 18 therapists that all worked for one company, and now they're crushing it down in uh, Little Rock. Uh, we do have one therapist in uh, Florida. Greg, raise your hand. So if you have questions, we're going to do questions here at the end. If you don't get to ask me your question at the end, you have to ask Greg your question at the break. Okay, so Greg will answer all of your questions. He's your guy to go to in Florida for 180. Um, so now I hope that you see how the traits of innovators fit into the journey that I took from the time that I was in junior high until now. Now I want you to think back to the person that you texted the name up and see if they, um, if they fall into this category. And see if they are on this slide. So I don't need to tell you who these people are or what their product is because you know them by their logos. So I know we had a couple Elon Musks. I saw a couple Steve Jobs on there. Um, I don't know if I saw an Oprah or a Schultz or a, a Ray Kroc on there, but obviously all of these people went through the innovation process and got to where they are. So the question is, do you know the story behind some of these people? So Ray Kroc didn't start the McDonald's empire until he was in his 50s. Uh, when I talk about finding like-minded people, Ray Kroc actually had a friend uh, that he made in the military bef long before he did anything uh, McDonald's-wise, and uh, they bounced ideas off of each other. That guy has an amusement park that's down the street from you guys here called Disney World. Did you know that um, in the early days of Nike, Phil Knight was building the empire, Nike was doing over $2 million in profit, and he wasn't taking home a paycheck. Um, innovation on top of innovation. I don't know if there's anybody who innovates more on top of their previous innovation than Steve Jobs did. So we have phones that are in our pockets that have more technology in them than the first moon landing because Steve Jobs kept innovating and re-innovating. Tesla's on there, so all of you people that are big Elon Musk fans, there's Tesla. So. Hopefully now you can see um, how these people took their steps and you can kind of see like, kind of see how you can start taking those same steps. So we're gonna do a little uh, participation here. So everybody knows how to do the, the two clap drill. I say give me two claps and you give me, <laughs> give me two claps. <laughs> give me three claps. <laughs> give me one clap. Okay, so competition. This side of the room, give me two claps if, you're, if you think that you are able to start taking apart your thinking. Give me two claps. Ah, that side of the room. Give me two claps if you can start taking apart your thinking. All right, this side of the room. Who of you are inspired to start thinking critically and taking apart your thinking while you're in the clinic? In the clinic? Give me two claps. All right. Who on the far side is ready to start questioning everything they believed and everything that they see. Give me two claps. All right. Uh, who is ready to find like-minded people to grow with? Whole room, if you're ready to find like-minded people to grow with, give me three claps. Who is going to expect more from their profession? Everybody in the back, give me two claps if you expect more from your profession. Okay. Uh, who's ready to reignite the flame that got them down to the road to being in the profession that you're at? Everybody in the room, give me three claps. All right, and who's ready to be the future of sports medicine, physical therapy, and medicine in general? Give me one clap. All right. So, now that you know what innovation is, how it applies to us, and why it's so vital in the field of sports medicine, um, I hope you believe that everyone here today has a vision, a purpose, and the will to be uh, innovators themselves. The great limitation, the, gr the limitations that we have, as I alluded to before, in any profession, not just our profession, is that sometimes we take information that is given to us 
without taking that information apart. Most likely we make decisions on an everyday basis based on inferences and assumptions that were handed down to us. So it's our job as um, quality thinkers to take that thinking apart and think about why we are doing what we are doing. So let's revisit this question. Wouldn't you rather fail daring to be great at something you are passionate about than just being quote unquote successful at something that has minimal impact? No thanks, I'm good being um, decent at something that I'm not passionate about or yes, I want to reignite that fire that led me to go through all of the education to get where I'm at now so I can have a major impact on my profession and my patients. All right. So, I leave you with one quote from one innovator. The great enemy of truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. Too often we hold fast to the cliches of our forebears. We subject, we subject all facts to a prefabricated set of interpretations. We enjoy the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. Thank you. All right, we're going to do uh, questions. I'm sure you got some. All right, so I have one. Okay. How do you handle, and, and nobody has 100% success, nobody. I don't have it in surgery, you don't have it in clinic, nobody. No one out here has 100% success. So my question to you is this, how do you handle the patient or the criticism, especially when you're being innovative and new? Because the, the first thing that conventional wisdom is gonna say is, run away from that clinic. How do you handle that with the patient and everything else? And, and by the way, you're not getting rid of my orthotics. <laughs> I can. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> I've tried it before and I'm back at it. So, but anyway, how, how do you handle that with the patient, with, with the others? When, when that person who you've done these things to, you know, has not worked out and you don't have the quote unquote conventional wisdom to back you up? So great question. Um, so it's really hard to try to explain how everything works in a presentation. So the good thing is when we have a patient on the table, they actually feel the difference. So I could explain things till I'm blue in the face. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And they'd look at me and be like, yeah, sure you are. I've, you know, I've done this before. I don't believe you. But as soon as you put your hands on them and change their strength by 142% in 10 seconds, you see the light bulb click on and they're like, wow, what did you do? How did you do that? So as you continue to work through and you talk about, okay, so what I'm doing, what I'm doing is stimulating the, neuro the neuromuscular junction. What that does is this, what that does is that. So you continue to break down what you're doing on a physiological level, but you're breaking it down to somebody who doesn't have a medical background. So when you talk on their level, and they get off the table and can do things that they couldn't do 15 minutes before, that's, that's when they say, yes, I'm going to do this. So uh, pretty typical that we'll have a low back pain patient come in and we'll do the screen and this is their toe touch and their back is killing them. Put them on the table, work on them. Don't touch their back. Don't do anything to their back. Get them off the table and say, okay, touch your toes. And they look at you like, well, you didn't do anything to my back. How am I gonna to touch my toes? And just say, trust me, touch your toes. And they drop down and they touch their toes and they have no low back pain because what you did was get rid of the cause of the low back pain. So the low back pain is coming from the lumbar extensors working way too much, the abs, the glutes, the hamstrings, something else not working enough. So once you get those other things that are inhibited kicked back on, now the low back extensors can basically say, okay, I can let go now, I don't have to freak out, and I can move. So as you 
educate them, and they'll come back with, for the second visit and be like, I still don't understand anything that you did, but I felt fantastic. So you go through it again. Um, and, and basically what patients tell their friends is, I don't know what the heck he did, but I'm 100% better. I'm not wearing my orthotics. I'm not wearing a brace. I'd only had to go twice instead of two times a week for six weeks. Um, and that's, that's the proof. So do we try to market this to physicians and give them a speech like this and think, oh, they're going to refer all their patients to us? No, they're probably going to think we're crazy. But the patients understand that what we did worked and they keep coming back. Some questions. Come on. Uh, the, just run up and grab the microphone. So the, if you notice on the, um, on the foam rolling video, we rolled the IT band, not the gluteus medius, but we tested the gluteus medius. So basically what, what I wanted to see is, foam rolling is usually done, the, the most foam rolled part of a human's body is usually the IT band. Everybody foam, foam rolls with the IT band. So we said, okay, what, is, what has, um, attachment points to the IT band that we could test strength because obviously the IT band, just like the plantar fascia, does not contract, it's, it's a, a connective tissue. So the correlation was because we're, we're rolling um, the IT band, which is similar to the plantar fascia. The, we're not saying that the plantar fascia contracts, but we're saying that the plantar fascia uh, supports the foot. And as you're rolling that, you're also uh, rolling the foot intrinsics and all the other things that are connected there. So you're correct. We're not trying to strength test the plantar fascia or the IT band. We're, we're testing the muscles that attach to it. And you know, that could be a good point. So we've, so we've also done studies on, or pilot studies on rolling. We, we've done stick rolling on the quads. We've done foam rolling on the quads. We've done lacrosse ball rolling on the lats. And you see the same results across the, across the spectrum. But you're, you're correct as far as um, the plantar fascia not being a contractile tissue. So actually we've started using blood flow restriction training after looking through the research and, and seeing that there is actually something there that we can use. So uh, we've started using the blood flow restriction predominantly with our lower extremity non-weight bearing or partial weight bearing patients and see phenomenal results as far as once they can start weight bearing again, um, that they're a little bit ahead of the curve as far as comparing them to somebody who's just doing non-weight bearing exercises without the blood flow restriction. Correct. Yep. Uh, so I don't think she's been back in. I think she discharged probably like six months ago, something like that. So she hasn't been back in. Um, which is so with the plantar fascia patient, and people say, well, she was better. Um, for that six months in between. So what we tell our patients is if you're wearing orthotics, your plantar fasciitis isn't gone. You're still, you're still living with plantar fasciitis. You're just putting it in a position where it doesn't have stress on it anymore. So as soon as you let the foot pronate again, plantar fascia symptoms come back because it was never gone because it was stuck in supination the whole time. So another good question. So what we do on the table as far as re-facilitating normal, facil normal neuromuscular facilitation doesn't work if we don't uh, reinforce it with exercise. So your body wants to stay the way it's been. So if you've had low back pain for two years and, and it's, you've had certain things that are inhibited, your body's gonna fight to stay that way because that's what it thinks normal is. So the important thing is we get them off the table and we go through 
um, what we call reinforcement exercises. So have them walk, have them squat, have them lift weight, have them walk with load, all that kind of stuff, because that's what will get muscles to work again with each other and pass the stress off. So when we're doing things on a table, it's one muscle at a time, which is not functional. It's not weight bearing, it's not multi-joint, it's not multi-plane, that is not functional. So we need to get them off the table and reassess the function and then start giving them things to make that muscle, to make the vastus lateralis, work with the gluteus medius, work with the soleus, work with the um, contralateral lat. So all that stuff has to work together. So in order for that to work together, we have to first make sure everything's turned on. So that's why we go, every visit is head to toe assessment, head to toe treatment, then get them off the table and then it's functional reassess or functional reinforcement exercises. And those are the exercises that we give them for home. So the home program is basically, here's five exercises, do these two to three times a day between now and your next visit. And it should feel like you forget to, to do your exercises because your problem's gone. Yep. Foot. And I've played around with my own arch to see like my biomechanical changes. Um, you know, when I have more arch support, like my, you know, everything is happier. Um, so I just, you kind of talked about um, foam rolling and stretching. You didn't really hit too much on your beats with the orthotics. Okay. So remember two things when it, goes to, when it comes to orthotics. So let's say you're assessing somebody and fitting them for an orthotic. Did you also take images of their knees and their hips? I doubt it, right? Okay, so your foot was made to work with your body. So if I try to make your foot look like somebody else's foot and you have different hips and knees and lumbar spine and you move differently than they do, now I just threw off everything above the foot. So the other thing to remember is if we, so if somebody comes in when they're in their 50s and they have their first onset of plantar fasciitis and we look at them and we say their arch has fallen, um, so we say, let's put them in an orthotic. Can't we make their foot function the same way it did for the last 50 years? Or are we just going to say, put an orthotic for the next 50 years? So I'd rather assess them and figure out, can we make the muscles that are supposed to stabilize your foot and maintain your arch? Can we turn those things back on and teach you to re-educate those things so they can work by themselves? Because if you don't pronate and supinate, you can't unload and load. So if this is my foot, if I can't pronate, I can't pronate at my hip, I can't pronate at my knee, my lumbar spine is off. So a lot of times we'll have patients come in without foot pain for low back pain, hip pain, shoulder pain, tension headaches. Ask them how long they've been having their pain. They'll say about a year. Take a look at their shoes because we have everybody take their shoes off when we assess and they have orthotics. Ask them how long have you had the orthotics? Oh, about a year. Yep. They're trying to shove bones where they haven't been. Right. So, so our advice on the orthotics is we don't tell patients, take your orthotics out and throw those things away. So we'll say, what I'd like you to do is wean out of your orthotics. So if we have somebody who's been wearing an orthotics for 30 years and their feet are a mess, we know that in a 45-minute treatment, we're not going to reverse all that stuff. So what we have to do is continue to remind those muscles to, to kick on teach them how to walk with pronation and supination again. So that might take two weeks, that might take two months. So during that process, we'll tell them, try to start your day with your orthotics. If you get through a whole day and you don't have any foot pain, you don't have to put them in, great. If your foot starts to hurt, that means you've already fatigued. So I can, re I can reestablish facilitation, but I cannot give you muscle endurance. So you're still gonna fatigue. So as, as soon as you fatigue and your foot pain comes back or your low back pain comes back after you took the orthotics out, then put the orthotics back in. So that's how we wean out. So we don't just say, stop, stop doing that today. Don't ever do that again. It's terrible for you. So just educate them. This is, this is why you're using this. This is why we want to try to get away from using that. And this is how we're going to do it. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Very enlightening. You.